my Discord server got me a shirt somehow, and I thought it was hilarious. Anyway, uh, to the video topic. Today we're going to be reacting 5-amino tetrazole, which is this compound here with potassium permanganate. And if you have a bit of knowledge about the theory behind potassium permanganate and what kind of reactions it generally tends to do, you'd expect it to oxidize an amine which is this group here, to a nitrate. As we've seen in some previous videos I've made, um, in which we wanted to make this sodium nitrotetrazole, this reaction doesn't work, and we need uh, a different reaction, which is using um, a nitrite salt. The reason this doesn't work, well, actually, actually, technically, this reaction does work. You do form this compound, but because we're in basic solution here, we're going to use um, some sodium hydroxide. As soon as this is formed, this nitrate group will react with this amine group much faster than this permanganate can actually oxidize the amine group. So we don't end up with this as our final product. We actually end up with like a joined tetrazole as our end product. And I'll draw that reaction up now. That tetrazole group is a little wonky, but you get the idea. What actually happens is two of these, oh, where's my chalk? Two lots of this, here's one lot of this. So we have the two nitrogens joined together with a double bond. So this molecule here is 5-azo, a 5,5-azo because we're talking about the fifth position here on each tetrazole. We go 5, comma, 5 dash, and that hyphen means like, you know, on different tetrazole rings. If it was just 5,5, 5, 5, 5, comma, 5, you could kind of say you got two things off the same ring. But 5, 5 dash, you know, two different rings, azo, tetrazole. And the azo is because of this double bond here is an azo azo um, bond here. So yes, so that's the synthesis for today. Banganate oxidation forming 5,5-azo tetrazole um, pentahydrate. And it'll be as a sodium salt. We're going to use a, a quite an excess of sodium hydroxide here. It's a pretty cool one-step reaction, but um, as many of you would have worked out already, there's, there's an ulterior motive of why we're trying to make this compound in particular. And I'll draw that reaction up on the board now. This is the real reason we want this 5,5-azo-tetrazole. Uh, if we react it with bromine, we form isocyanogen tetrabromide, which we can react with sodium azide to form isocyanogen tetraazide. Quite a famed compound for good reason. There's a lot of nitrogens <laughs> and only two carbons, you know, so it's a very, very energetic compound, very unstable. Before anyone corrects me, I know that one of these... Um, for azide groups actually rearranges and forms as a tetrazole group. We'll talk more about this compound later. I just wanted to say, obviously, I'm sure many of you realize this, but this is why we want this compound today. So we can attempt this synthesis later on. So this is my five amino tetrazole stockpile here. And they're quite old now, November 2017. Yeah, that's a year old. And Gager runs his synthesis on a 50 gram scale. I think it's 51 grams. I'm going to be able to scrounge together between these two probably two grams. You know, I wish I had more of it, but it takes a while to mix, and two grams should be enough. It is very yellow, as I have complained about before, but that shouldn't be a problem anyway. I only got one and a half grams out of here. There's a little bit left, but I don't like using up the entirety of the starting material. We need something to compare the end product to to see, you know, how physical properties have changed and that sort of thing. Stir bar. It's a bit big, but... It'll be all right. Things are basically nearly dissolved at room temperature, so um, we'll get it heating. All right, this is all good, apart from the fact that this stir bar doesn't want to turn, so I think it's just too heavy for being too far up, so uh, I'll just switch it out for a lighter one. Much better. And I'm an idiot, because at this point, we need to add three grams of potassium permanganate, well, three to four grams, um, and then that's it. That's the, that's the whole synthesis. So, do I have three grams of potassium permanganate? That's the thing to check before you start a procedure. Do you have all the chemicals that you need? No, that that's not three grams at the bottom there. I must have used it all up in the making hexane heptane from from fuel video. I thought I had a lot more permanganate than I do, but it's fine. I don't think we should need too much. I'm still cleaning the permanganate stains off this bloody flask because of it. And lots of other flasks that need cleaning. <laughs> ah, that's really annoying. Well, the good news is I can kind of stop this procedure here and turn off the heat. It should keep. It should keep fine in the, the two or three weeks that we need <laughs> to wait for it to turn up. But still, now the obvious question is, could I use another oxidizing agent other than potassium permanganate? Seeing as I have dichromates, persulfates, 
ozone. <laughs> Seeing as I have my entire stockpile of five amino tetrazole on the line here, I don't really want to take any risks. We'll fade to black and we'll come back in however long. And you know, good luck to future me. All right, that only took me a week because um, I forget that I can still buy potassium permanganate over the counter in some pharmacies I know of. I think this was $17 for 50 grams, which is a bit overpriced, but um, that's what you get for buying things over the counter. So I've got 2.8 grams here of potassium permanganate and I'm gonna be adding it gradually just as a solid. It's just gently refluxing. I've just got it up to temperature now and it seems reasonably unchanged. After the week, it was just sitting at room temperature. That wasn't meant to happen. Shit. Oh, how did it not overflow? <laughs> Whoops. Okay, let's try again with an even smaller amount. Alright, I'm going to stop adding it into the solid. What I'm going to do is I'm going to dissolve this up in a little bit of water and then drip it in because this is too crazy. Too crazy. Still seems to be getting very angry, but you know, what do you expect adding permanganate into a 100 degree solution? All right, I'll let that go for a little while. Problem is now that I'm kind of getting to the end of the flask volume, which is always a bit of a worry. Might be hard to see on camera, but the purple color is just starting to persist. You can see that just flashes of purple there as I shine a light into it. Yeah, so we're probably three quarters of the way through the permanganate and um, I've turned the heating down a little bit so we're not at a gentle reflux anymore, um, which isn't helping to destroy the permanganate so quickly, but um, we're, we're definitely making progress. All right, the color is no longer fading. Uh, we did add a uh, vast excess of potassium permanganate. I feel like we've confidently oxidized everything we can in solution. We're just gonna have to destroy all the remaining permanganate. You can see that purple color slightly still quite a bit of permanganate left in solution. So we want to destroy it, but I'm just going to let it cool down before we go about neutralizing it with any alcohol because um, otherwise it could get violent, which is not what we want at this stage. So I mean, heating this kind of thing is not great. At the end of the day, we are making an explosive here. The uh, end product is an explosive. We can't shy away from that fact. What I wanted to do was use like a plastic cup to heat it in. I just feel a bit better with explosives. You know, if everything blows up, <laughs> or just a little bit blows up, it's in a plastic cup. It's not so bad as having it in glass. We've got to remember that there's still quite a lot of sodium hydroxide here in this solution. So if we heat uh, plastic and a lot of sodium hydroxide, we'll end up destroying the plastic. So we can't really um, avoid the glass. It's just in some hot water. It's not super hot. It's not you know under a rolling boil or anything like that. And we've got the fan going slowly just to keep this column of air moving, not to cool it down, but I find that it helps evaporate stuff off a bit better. It's in about 100 mils and we probably want it to be abound. 20, it's a bit less than half the volume we've taken off with that. It is very yellow. I uh, have a, <laughs> a superstition against yellow things in the lab. I think every yellow chemistry is, is bad and doomed to fail. I've had failures with yellow chemistry too many times in the past. I was very brave taking on this project knowing that it was gonna be yellow. Yeah, I have just, I have to go out. So <laughs> um, we're just gonna leave that and let everything cool down. I doubt we're gonna get any crystals, but we'll just come back and do more evaporation another day. 
All right, we've got our first crop of crystals here. Look how nice they are. I uh, just washed them with a little bit of ice cold water, um, which I'm sure lost some, and, and a little bit of ice cold ethanol. We'll evaporate that down a bit more and get another second crop of crystals. I just wanted to, you know, get some yield while we're ahead um, with this first crop. So what I did is I got the remainder of the solution and uh, evaporated that down very slowly some more, including all the washings from the first crystals as well. So we didn't lose any product there with um, some washings. And it's been in the fridge and we have some absolutely beautiful crystals in here. There's also some dirt, um, as in I think it's manganese dioxide that's made it all the way through because we had like 200 mils of solution and we've now put it down to about 10 mils. Just a little bit of the um, like colloidal or suspended particles of manganese dioxide that make it through the filter just tend to get concentrated right down here. I should be able to decount this dirty solution off the top of them. Yeah, check out the size of those crystals. Yeah. As a final product is actually a tetrazole still, we should be able to characterize it a little bit uh, because it should be an energetic compound. So if we heat it, we should see something energetic come out of it. Ooh, that's a little bit more explosive than I thought it was. All right, my whole gram suddenly got a little bit more dangerous. That's um, it's good to check how explosive your final product product is. That's um, all right. Maybe I'll store the product wet until needed, and I shouldn't have grown such large crystals of it. I've never grown such large, perfect, single crystals of an explosive before, for good reason. If I knew it was this explosive, then I wouldn't have grown such large crystals. Anyway, I'm interested to blow some of these up in slow motion. I've never, never blown up such uh, perfect crystals before. Here's our final yield, which if we assume is the pentahydrate, and is what we're told it should be, it's only a 51% yield. We started with one and a half grams of 5 amino tetrazole. We used two molecules of 5 amino tetrazole. The mass works out, so it's 51%. Now, it may not be the pentahydrate, because 51% seems very low. The fact that it explodes very readily is evidence that perhaps it's only got three or two molecules of water attached to each um, molecule of the tetrazole. That would explain why it's perhaps more explosive than I was expecting. Our 1.1 gram should be enough to continue on with our project. This has worked very well, so I'm confident um, of the purity of this product. So thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video. But last of all, I'm just going to add some water to these crystals. Even though they're such lovely crystals, I'm not confident in storing such a um, sensitive explosive just in this glass jar while they're perfectly dry. And in the next step of this reaction, uh, we need to dissolve it in water anyway, so as long as we know how much we have, which I needed to dry it to weigh it, now we can just add water to it and use all of it in the next step. Mm -hmm.